So good morning, everybody. Ah, I'm so excited about this class because it, it's wildflowers. Um, and um, today is part of the Landscape Matters program. I'm also really excited because we have one of our volunteers, Sherry Loman, Shirley Loman. Sherry. <laughs> Not the first time I've No, no, sorry. <laughs> we have Shirley Loman, one of our volunteers. She is going to be doing the presentation today about wildflowers. And, um, you know, if someone's qualified to do so, it is definitely Shirley. So I'm really excited that she's doing this. Um, and we have some people online and we have one of our volunteers that's also helping monitor the chat box online. So feel free if you're online to uh, send any questions you have in the chat box, we can make sure they're answered and you all can ask questions at any time, feel free to do so. Um, and as part of all of our programs, everybody that's registered, um, what we'll do is we can take and we'll follow up in an email with a copy of the program um, and some additional information related to today's program, just so you have not just a copy of it, but you also have some digital resources from the university and some additional things. It's nice and handy little quick reference that you can even save into your emails. So before we get, well, without further ado, because I'm done, um, I want to bring Shirley on up and uh, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thanks for coming out in the rain, and I'm glad you guys are hopefully home and dry. Uh, we're going to talk about wildflowers and why they're important and some easy ones that we can grow in our garden. So whenever we talk about any plants, we talk about the Florida Friendly Landscape Program, and it, it's a, an integrated approach that helps you plan whatever style garden you want in the most environmentally responsible way so that your plants are successful, uh, you hopefully will spend less money, less water, less fertilizer, it's friendly to wildlife, um, hopefully it's less work, not always, uh, but the main goals for Florida Friendly Landscaping are to conserve water and to protect the water quality because as our state grows, these are very important uh, items to to uh, take care of. So these are the nine principles and all of them apply to what we're talking about today, but mainly it's right plant, right place. We wanna tell you uh, uh, the plants that we hope will be successful in your garden. And we talk about several different uh, environmental uh, things that will uh, impact your, your choices. So that if you have uh, mostly shade, you'll know which ones grow in the shade, sun, so on and so forth. So what's the purpose of wildflowers? Um, or to look pretty. I mean, why have wildflowers evolved? And they have evolved with our insects and birds and mammals. Uh, they're very important in the, in the environment. Um, they're important source of food for pollinators, but also birds and other wildlife. So they are pretty in our garden and we do like them. And we do want to encourage natives because or Florida friendly that um, have some wildlife benefit because as our state is getting built out, we need to uh, be able to replace some of this lost habitat with in our gardens. <clears throat> so Doug Tallamy, who's an, an entomologist at the University of Maryland has done a lot of studying about the benefits of pollinators and the benefits of certain plants to pollinators. And while our wildflowers are very important for pollinators in, in their uh, cat, caterpillar stage and pupil stage, as well as in their flying stage, such as butterflies and caterpillars, um, trees are even more important because all trees have flowers and an oak tree is host to over 300 different species of caterpillars. So that's a lot of bird food. You, have, you, you may think oh, 300, Caterpillars are going to chew my oak tree up. Well, you don't know they're up there, do you? You never notice that there are all those little critters up there. But the birds know, and especially in the spring when they're feeding their young, they need those little soft caterpillars to feed their young. So wildflowers and many of our native trees and shrubs are very important. And even though wildflowers are pretty, we need them to do more than just be pretty. They need to help with the environmental issues that we're all facing. So we're gonna start with shaded sites. How many of you have shade? And you think you can't have pretty flowers because nothing blooms in the shade. Well, we're gonna look at some shaded 
uh, plants that grow in the shades. And uh, the first one is the cardinal flower. It does need some moisture. So if you don't have a wet area along a stream or a low lying area that's a little bit more moist, you might need to do a little bit of supplemental irrigation on this. But it's a very stunning flower. And that's why it's the first one on there. It's going to make a statement in your garden. And if, if you try it and it's not successful right away, you know, try it in a different spot. And uh, some of these are a little hard to grow, but, but give, them, give them a chance because they're definitely worth the effort. Now the blue phlox is a native woodland phlox and it makes a great, really pretty um, statement in the spring. It blooms early spring, late winter, early spring. It likes a little bit of moisture and it also likes alkaline soil. And a lot of us have alkaline soil. So that's a, a benefit to some of us, especially in woodlands. Um, you know, most woodland plants like more acidic soil because there's so much leaf litter, but our our leaf litter can't keep up with our limestone sand dune that we live on basically. So this is a good, good one for Florida. The next two slides are both golden ragwort. Um, this one blooms from February to April and the next one blooms a little later. So you, it, uh, but notice the, the genus name, Pacara. The next one, the genus name is Senecio. However, um, are you getting any internet interference? Because I just got it. Okay. okay, great. Um, this Senecio has just been repositioned in the Pacara genera. genera. What's that word? Yeah, that, genera. <laughs> thank you, genera. <laughs> it just totally escaped me for a minute. So this is an interesting thing. If you're looking for this plant, you might find it under Senecio or Pacara or Pacara. And it blooms a little bit later. So with these two in your shady garden, you would have a nice, long, sunny yellow uh, for almost six months. You have almost six months of bloom. And again, it might need a little supplemental moisture, but probably not much in the woodlands. This is one of my favorites, the Indian pink. It blooms um, in April and May. As you can see from the picture, it is a nice, well-behaved, small little clump. It doesn't seem to seed around. However, if it did seed around, I'm sure my rabbits would see it before I did because <laughs> that is my one problem with this plant. It's very tasty to the rabbits. So when it's coming up, because it is, it is um, deciduous, so it does come back up in the spring as nice tender little shoots. So you either need to protect them by maybe putting a little fence around it, if you have rabbits, not everybody has rabbits or put it up in a pot. And, and it does it is really nice in a pot because you can move it to where you want to see it more when it's in bloom and then maybe move it to the back of the garden when it's not in bloom. But it's a nice little plant even when it's not in bloom. Hummingbirds like it. Uh, it does have a, a flush of blooms in the spring. And then if you deadhead it, it will, it will bloom again. <clears throat> and the rest of the year, it's um, a, a pretty little foliage plant. Lyre leaf sage is a great native salvia. It blooms in the spring and after the flowers go, go to seed, you can mow it. And so this is a great um, alternative to lawns in shade. It um, likes a little bit of moisture, but my place is not moist at all and it does great. Uh, it does reseed prolifically, so and after you mow it, it's just a little crown of you know of leaves. So it's low growing. You, you don't even notice it until it blooms again in the, the next year. And we will have lyre leaf sage at the sale. So moving into plants that have a little need a little more sun, I want to point out these two pictures. The one on the right is. Coreopsis and the one on the left is Coreopsis with Cosmos mixed in. And we're not going to talk about Cosmos because it's an, a non native annual, or we don't have a slide, we are going to talk about it because it's, it reseeds very easily. It's easy to grow from seed. It's a very light, delicate, airy plant that you can just spread in amongst all your other wildflowers and it doesn't crowd them out. And 
it, it blooms continuously. So when other things are, are not blooming so well, this will still give you some color. So blanket flower, bless its little heart, just got kicked out of the native club in Florida, but it is still Florida friendly and we still highly recommend it because it's very salt tolerant. Um, you'll see it along the beach blooming along with the dune sunflower, which we'll talk about in a minute. It reseeds, it is an annual. So by the end of the season, uh, it will start looking a little uh, seedy and you can save the seeds, you can cut the seeds heads off and save the seeds, or you can just trim it back and it will rebloom because that's what annuals do. Once they set seeds, they say, okay, I'm done. I don't have to do anything else. But if you keep deadheading it, it, it has not done its job for the year, which is to produce seeds. So it will keep blooming longer. It's a great, it looks great in combination with the dune sunflower too. Uh, bee balm is one of the top pollinator plants. Uh, it mine's about three feet tall by almost three feet wide. It's blooming right now, covered with pollinators. It likes hot, dry sites. There's not much to dislike about it, except that it's a bit of a bully in the garden. It likes to crowd other things out. So give it some space or put it next to other robust plants that can hold their own with it. This is a pretty uh, airy little shrub too. It, it's lighter and airier, so it's not quite as much of a bully as the um, Monarda. Uh, it blooms all year from April to November. It loves sandy sites, so most of us are good there. Uh, so has anybody grown this one? Okay. It's one I'm still looking for. I'd like to try this one. So we're gonna talk about a couple of the milkweeds. Um, this, this one grows in hot, dry sites. Uh, there are two that grow, that are called swamp milkweed that grow in more moist sites. And none of the native milkweed are real easy to grow unless you get it in the right spot. So if you ha don't have luck with it in one area, try it in an another area because we do need to uh, grow the natives as much as possible. Are you guys familiar with the, uh, the problems with the tropical milkweed that's much easier to grow? Um, uh, for the people who aren't, uh, it's what you usually find in the big box stores. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a great caterpillar uh, plant, larval food plant for the monarchs, which the monarchs only feed on milkweed. The problem comes in because the natives will go dormant over the winter and the tropical will not. And there's a disease that the longer the plant grows, the more it builds up from exposure to infected butterflies. And then it can infect other butterflies, which will ultimately kill the butterflies. So if you have the tropical milkweed, be sure to cut it back between October 31st, Halloween and Thanksgiving. And then you may have to cut it back one more time during the winter because it's uh, will you know we've had such warm winters that it will re-sprout. The other thing you can do is just pull it out because many seedlings will come back from the tropical. It seeds prolifically, so you won't have any trouble with it um, coming back on its own. And then you don't have to worry about cutting it back two or three times. Has, has anybody ever seen the drumming flocks on the side of the road? They used to use that for, <laughs> for uh, roadside plantings. And it's, it's stunning, but for some reason, I can't get it to grow in my garden. But I'm not gonna give up. Um, I'm gonna keep trying to find the right spot for it because it is definitely worth the effort. And it also combines well with a lot of other uh, you can sort of see in the top left, there's a little coreopsis in the back, but it mixed in with coreopsis and cosmos and some of the other wildflowers, black-eyed Susans, purple clone flowers. It's really stunning. So coreopsis, our state wildflower, lots and lots of varieties of them. Some are annuals, some are perennials. They bloom almost constantly until we have a frost, um, their heights vary, their leaf texture varies. Most of them are very airy and light, so they mix in with others and there's no problem with them uh, trying to crowd anything out. Again, 
rabbits really like them, but if they're packed in with enough other things, sometimes the rabbits will miss them. Dune sunflower we mentioned with um, the gallardia. It's very salt tolerant, grows on the dunes, and uh, it blooms almost constantly. When it gets a little bit older, it will get a little woody and you can cut that back and let the new seedlings come up from under it and get some fresh new growth. I had this great idea to plant um, a, a salt tolerant perennial garden on the seawall. So I had three of these little guys in one gallon pots and a bunch of other salt tolerant perennials. And within probably a month, the dune sunflower had covered the whole thing, which was great but I wish I'd known that before I put those other plants in there. But it got um, some wave action from Ian and it has turned a little bit brown, but some of it's still as green as ever. It did um, get totally toasted in Matthew because the water came up higher, but the seedlings came up. As soon as I pulled the dead stuff out, the seedlings were coming up in that salt inundated soil. So it is definitely a good coastal plant. This one I've just started growing and it, it doesn't look like this picture yet, but it's getting there. It's, it's one, little, one little stalk right now, but it is blooming and I have great hopes for it. And it loves dry sites, which I, that's all I have. So is anybody else on dry, dry sandy soil? So this is, this should be a good one. It, it is recommended by the wildflower group and um, they they grow a lot of these wildflowers in gardens because some of these things are great in the wild but they're just really not going to be very happy in your garden this is an, another one that i really really like this one it's very salt tolerant it looks like rosemary it's it's not but even the little blooms are similar to rosemary it's evergreen salt tolerant hot dry sandy soil, it's, it's happy. I just moved mine from a, a site that I thought was pretty nice and stuck it in a, just a sandy hot site and it is so much happier now, it's, it just took off. So don't treat it too nicely, don't, don't overwater it because it will rot. So have you guys noticed the goldenrod and the swamp sunflowers on the side of the road? Um, 200, they're, they're almost all, oh, and I have to tell you guys, I saw the weirdest thing. I saw a remote controlled mower today in the ditch <laughs> on the way. I, I did, <laughs> the guys out there, I thought, oh man, little boys are going to grow up and want to be that guy that has the remote controlled mower, but he wasn't mowing up where the, the goldenrod was, so I was glad about that. Um, there are lots of different goldenrods that do well in Florida. This one's a little bit shorter one. On the tall ones, uh, you know, they can be easily six feet tall. So in before July 4th, you can cut them back so they stay a little bit shorter. They'll still bloom and they'll still, still get tall, but maybe not quite as tall. And a lot of them can take a little bit of light shade, but I think that they grow more upright if they're in full sun. But that's just a thought. I don't, I don't know if that's true or not. Joe pie weed is another really tall, uh, up against the fence, back of the border, next to the house plant. It, as you can see, it gets six feet or more. It does like some moisture. Um, it's a great pollinator plant. You see a lot of Joe pie weed up further north. Uh, if you're from North Georgia or further up, you see a lot of that in the wild. We don't. I see it occasionally along the side of the road, but not as much down here. And ironweed is another one that's tall and, and purple and uh, great pollinator plant. Uh, it says it, yeah, it, it flowers summer to fall and you can cut that one back as well to keep it a little bit shorter. And it does like well-drained soils, but I think it likes to be watered regularly, just not swampy. Miss flower is one that likes moist soils. Um, it's very, it's low growing. It's um, also plays well with others. It doesn't crowd things out. It's a really pretty flower too. It it um, adds a different look. 
um, with a black eyed Susan or a purple coneflower or even a liatris with the spiky. It gives you a, a nice, uh, for, for when you're designing and you're trying to think about these different design elements, this is a nice low growing mounder that is um, very easy to use. Rudbeckias, we have a lot. Rudbeckia herda, I think, is the one that's used the most in Florida, uh, but we have a lot of different varieties. In my experience, they don't look like they do in Connecticut. They're not going to be quite as floriferous as these pictures, but again, they play well with others. They don't crowd things out. They bloom all summer long. Uh, this says August to October for this one, but there are other um, species that will bloom other times. So you can have constant bloom with these if you uh, plant a few different species. Partridge pea is another um, salt tolerant, airy shrub. If you can see in that top picture, it has real ferny leaves and those are sensitive to the touch. If you touch them, they'll close up. The other interesting thing about this is that it has nectaries along the stem. So insects can feed on the flowers, but they can also feed on the nectar on the stems. And you'll see ants going up and down the stems uh, feeding on this nectar. And this one is a host plant for the sulfur butterflies. And again, it's salt tolerant, likes hot, dry sites. Passion flower is probably my favorite vine. This is the native incarnata. There are several other natives that aren't quite as showy. And then we also have a non-native called Passiflora incense that um, is not, it's not invasive or harmful in any way. It's a little bit darker purple than this one, and it has a scent. And this is the host plant for the zebra longwings if you plant it in the shade, and for the Gulf fritillaries if you plant it in the sun. And they will. They will chow down on this, but don't worry, the passion vine evolved to handle this and it will come back with no problem. Does anybody else have a problem with passion vine taking over everything in the entire garden? I mean, mine is falling up. <laughs> My neighbor actually asked me to do invasive species because it, I used to have, well, I used to have more, I don't have more anymore. But when, before I would go to mow, I would have to walk to see all the ones that were sticking yeah. up to see if there were any butterflies or, or you know, uh, caterpillars or stuff on it so that I would move them to another location before I mowed. Yeah. So I think you probably heard that question, but if you didn't online, it's, if she asked about the aggressive tendency of, assertive tendency of passion buying. And I <laughs> It is, it is very assertive. Um, when it's happy in your garden, it's, it's going to move around, but just mow it down. As she said, she checked for butterfly eggs before she mowed it, which I never thought to do that, but that's a good, good thing to think about. Um, it can be uh, assertive, but it's easy to get rid of. You know, just whack it back with your mower. Um, I pull them up and stick them in pots and take them to the plant sale. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So any any plant that I like that that likes to spread around, I don't consider that a bad thing because I I know somebody I can share it with somewhere. Um, but it is definitely something to add to your garden, and it will cover an unsightly fence very quickly. And it's like the fence, but... <laughs> she says hers doesn't like the fence. So that you might have to um, give it a little support with some. Uh, twine or something on the fence if it doesn't want to go there. Uh, so again, this is another um, genus that we have lots of uh, different species in Florida, Meliatris. I have never seen the white one, but it looks like it would be a very nice uh, addition to a garden that you mainly saw at night. So it would show up more. Most of the Liatris are purples and lavenders. They um, give, give a lot of structure that most, there aren't too many other wildflowers that give you this upright structure. Most of them are more mounding. So this is a nice addition and it does 
not mind uh, well-drained soils, sandy soils. It's, it's happy with that. I've planted two or three, but unfortunately my um, bee balm has totally hidden them. So I don't even know if they're still alive. I'm, when I cut my bee balm back, I'll look for the guys and move them to a different place if they're still there. Carolyn, you have a question about passion vines. Does it hurt the trees to let them grow up? They grow up. Well, anything that, and Taylor, you might want to answer this one, but anything that covers the leaves so that they can't photosynthesize is eventually going to make the tree decline somewhat. I've never had them, um, they, they climb through my shrubs in and out. And they don't seem to bother the shrubs because there's enough foliage on the shrubs that they just uh, they just sort of add to it. If it got really heavy, I'd probably cut it back. What would what would you say, Taylor? I would say that no, they don't. They don't hurt it. Yeah, um, they will get a little unruly. It's the same kind of concern that people have with say like Spanish moss. Rhodomelia and might be covering trees, thinking that the weight could help impact the tree, but that doesn't. Um, there are two species of patch of flower that have that high invasion risk. Mm -hmm. No, it's not the red ones. They're actually all white. Um, it's a essential, like the physical anthers, they have that purple color, but um, they may end up having a problem because they may end up completely covering it too much, but the, usually it's not, it's not. Okay. If it, basically, if you didn't hear what Taylor said, if it's a native variety, it's probably not a concern. There are a couple of invasive species. Uh, I haven't seen them sold very often. Um, so I think we're, we're probably okay, but, you know, try to get the native if, if you can. And, you know, whatever your comfort level is, but uh, when you cut it back, you are cutting out uh, butterfly eggs and caterpillars usually. So if you can locate them to another vine, that would be great. Oh, the purple milkweed is one that um, grows more in like pine woods. So it's a very sandy site. I have not seen this one grown in this area, but I think it would be a good candidate uh, so if you, you know, try this, let us know how it does. I'm, I'm trying to find this one to, to try in my garden. <clears throat> the green eyes is what your uh, Florida wildflower pamphlet recommends because its um, requirements are the same as the non-native gallardia. I think the two of those planted together would be really pretty. And for the people in the audience, let's see if I can figure out where. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I can't. I can't show you the 20 easy to grow wildflower brochure, but you can go online and download load this from for free from the Florida Wildflower Foundation, and they have a lot of other brochures that are free to download also. Um, but they are recommending the. Uh, the green eyes as a replacement, as a native replacement for the gallardia. But again, the gallardia is doing no harm and the, it is a great pollinator plant. The scarlet hibiscus um, is a stunning plant. It's also very tall and the flowers are bigger than my fist. I think they only last a day, but as you can see, there are a lot of them on there. And I actually have seeds of the hibiscus today if anybody would like that. And also the partridge pea and the salvia. And um, the salvias we will have at the plant sale. And I don't think we're gonna have the, the partridge pea, um, but this is a great hummingbird plant. It's a really makes a statement. They, in my garden, they tend to be uh, more a single stem plant. So I'd plant two or three together to get this, this effect that in the lower, Picture. The, yes. You mentioned that the flower only lasts a couple of days on it, but it's it's producing flower that entire season. That individual plant has to produce flower. Yeah, let's go back to uh, scarlet hibiscus. Um, as you can see, it blooms late spring to late summer, and even though the flowers don't last long, they, it's always covered with flowers. It produces them 
this the whole time. It does like some moisture. And like I said, my garden's very dry. So I planted it near the air conditioner outlet where the water comes out. And it seems to be perfectly happy there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I made the mistake of putting a coon tea there once because it design wise, it was the perfect plant. Well, it it died because of the the water, the soil stayed too moist. So I thought, okay, we'll find something that likes the moisture. So this is probably my favorite. Um, it's more of a perennial lately because of our very mild winters, uh, but it reseeds. So you don't know if it's perennial or annual, but it's always there. It uh, usually stays under two feet high, but I have some that reseeded themselves in a shady area that grew up through a shrub to about eight feet because they were just looking for the sun. So, but they're prettiest if you keep them uh, pruned back to about one to two feet, they'll get uh, a little seedy looking because all of those red flowers make seeds, which is wonderful because it reseeds everywhere. Not only do the hummingbirds and butterflies feed on this, but I have seen birds and it's really funny when a cardinal does it. It's funny when little birds do it, but they they will walk up the stem to get the little seeds out of the, the seed pods. And even the little birds, they get to the end, they get right up there to get it and the thing breaks. So then they're hanging sideways and they're eating the seeds out and then they spread it around for you. Um, there's also the pink and the white and it, it really does, it's bloomed year round for probably the last three or four years in my garden. If you get a frost, it's gonna, it's gonna die, but the seeds will come back up in the spring and, and you'll never know it, it wasn't there. I love this little guy. He's a very sweet little weed, a lot of people would call him, but he blooms um, early spring with these nice little aster looking flowers. And then it also can be mowed and you don't know it's there until the next year when it blooms again. Like sandy sites, again, that's great for us. And this is one that you may have seen growing in the ditches. Have you guys seen Star Rush? It is, when you see it, it's, it, it's really amazing because there's just this little grass that grows in a wet spot. And then all of a sudden it looks like somebody threw a bunch of stars out on top. And they're pretty good size. It's hard to tell from this picture, but I'd say the white bract is probably a couple of inches, Taylor, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not like somebody said, oh, I saw a picture of a frog fruit uh, flower and I really wanted it until I realized it was the size of a match head. Well, this isn't one of those flowers. It's 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 big enough to make a show. And and uh, it's if you have a retention pond or a creek that you could plant it along, I'm sure it would do very well. Starry rosin weed is a, a robust plant. It's good to to uh, pair with some of those more aggressive plants like the bee balm and uh, goldenrods. Um, it blooms most of the year. It has very sturdy stems. Uh, the leaves are a little bit coarser than a lot of the um, wildflowers. So it gives a, a little more structure to the garden and you can deadhead it and save the seeds. And it definitely likes well-drained soil. And mine right now is probably six feet tall. So if I'd known it was going to get that tall, I would have cut it back before July 4th. I really have another question. Okay. Now I'm not sure if Ann heard it. Okay. Um, she said, I've never seen hummingbirds to leave their connector on the blue. Can anyone confirm the blues are high enough to take? Probably um, the hibiscus, maybe. If it's a hibiscus that you're wondering about the being a hummingbird plant, I can't verify that because I have my hibiscus in the same place where I have my firebush and my coral honeysuckle. And there's a lot of hummingbird activity, but I can't confirm that it's specifically on the hibiscus because the, the uh, firebush and the coral honeysuckle are there. They would probably choose those over the hibiscus. And you'll see that a lot of time, it's a plant that's supposed to be a good uh, pollinator plant or a good bird plant 
they may not go to it. Beauty Berry is an instance. Um, right now, there's a lot of Beauty Berry seeds out there and people say, well, I'm not seeing my birds on Beauty Berries. Well, the Beauty Berries stay on the plant a long time. So sometimes they'll wait until later in the season to use them as food. Or there may be something else that they just like better right now that's blooming at the same because or bearing fruit at the same time because fall is a big uh, harvest time basically. So there are a lot of berries out there and they may just be using something else. But mockingbirds seem to really like the beauty berry. I've, I have seen mockingbirds on my beauty berry and I don't usually have mockingbirds stick around my house except this time of the year. So. Again, I, I don't know. I, um, I can't see why it wouldn't be a hummingbird plant because it is bright red and it does produce nectar, but they may just like other plants in your garden more. So the, back to the swamp sunflower, that's the one that's blooming on the side of the road with the goldenrod. It is very tall, so you wanna use it in the back of the border or against a fence. It blooms this time of year. Every time I drive down 200 and see that in the goldenrod, I think it's, it's plant sale time. It blooms this time of the year, every year. And they are perennial. And they're, I mean, they are blooming on their own. Both of them are just on the side of the road. Nobody does anything except probably mow them occasionally. <clears throat> Tampa verbena is a, a nice little low growing plant. And I learned last week when we were putting this presentation together that it roots easily. So Friday, I put a little cutting in water to see how fast it would root and it was rooted by Monday. So that's, that's pretty quick. So I'm gonna start propagating this now that I know this and hopefully it, they'll do well once I move them into the soil. But it is, um, it blooms all year. It says it's full sun, but I can tell you that mine is growing in an oyster shell path in the shade because that's where it planted itself. It from, I, I don't, I must have had it in a pot that was in that area at some point and it's seeded there and it seems happy. So of course it's right in the middle of the path and I step over it. So it gets to live because they're, they're that, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with it wherever it wants to live, so. Twin flower is another little ground cover. Uh, there's two species. Th this one, oblongifolia and humistrata, likes a little more moisture than, the, than this one does. <clears throat> um, a few years ago, a master gardener gave me three little cuttings that were probably about three inches tall. And I now have a patch of this. It's at least three feet square. It chokes out weeds. It blooms constantly. It needs no attention from me. And it's at the front of my border, my wildflower border. And I planted a lot of low growing wildflowers in the front of my borders. And every other one, the um, blue eyed grass and the rain lilies and some of the other um, uh, Stokes Aster, they all got crowded out by the more aggressive plants, assertive plants. This one is holding its own. Nothing has crowded it out. I don't understand how because it's only maybe six inches tall, but it's, it's a very good ground cover, especially for the front of the border. This is another one that for some reason does not like my garden, but I'm gonna keep trying it because it is a stunning plant. Um, I love that the pine woods is just full of it, but in the garden, you get to see the up close really rich color a lot easier. It does like a little bit of moisture. Um, but I think I may have drowned mine because I put it in a spot that was a little too wet. But give it a try because it's definitely a stunning plant. So the wild petunia is also one of my favorites. It grows anywhere. It doesn't care if it's wet or dry, sunny or shady. And when this flower goes to seed, the seed pods will burst open when they ripen and spread them everywhere. So you can remove, you can, they don't land where you want them to. You can replant them somewhere else or you can just compost them, but they're really fun 
to watch spread around your garden on their own. It's like they have legs. Now the one on the bottom is the Mexican petunia, and that is an invasive species. It's what you'll probably see mostly in the big box stores. Please don't buy it. It's, you do not want it. It will take over the world and it is invasive and harmful to the, to the native environment. There is that, are- Is that true only for the big ones? Are the miniature Mexican petunias okay? Because that's what we've been told and I don't know if you think that's true. Well, this isn't research back, but my neighbor planted the small ones that are supposed to be uh, sterile and non-invasive. And it is in my garden all the time. You still discourage sterile varieties. You still spread pretty aggressively. They're just not producing seed. That might be the identical species. Okay. I don't, my neighbor gave me some. I didn't know what it was. It was like growing up everywhere. Yeah. And what you you'll learn to hate it. It's yeah. It's you know you think oh what a pretty easy plant and then it each your garden. Yeah, even this, and I don't know if you could hear you guys online, if you could hear Taylor, but he said, we discourage even this planting the sterile varieties because it does spread vegetatively. And like I said, my neighbor's plants are in my garden all the time and I'm pulling them up. Um, also, sometimes they're mislabeled. They're maybe labeled as sterile and not be sterile. So it's best to just stay with the native Ruelia carolinian. And you'll and you'll like this guy. He spreads around, but he's not he's not a bully. So any questions before we uh, talk about some some books and a few other things? Okay, so that's the hard question of the day is where do you get these things? So there are native plant sales around and plant sales like our Master Gardener plant sale and the St. Mary's plant sale, this, which both happen to be this weekend, uh, October 15th. And we, we do sell natives. Also, there are native plant nurseries. Unfortunately, there are none. Are there any in South Georgia? Okay. There aren't any in, there are a couple of uh, landscape companies Reflections of Nature and um, uh, Floral Living that do native landscape design, but they don't just sell uh, retail native plants. If you don't mind driving a little bit, I think it's called Maggie's Bird Farm. In the St. Augustine. Yeah. 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 Went there one and it was phenomenal. Yeah. There's um, Maggie's Herb Farm in St. Augustine. There's also um, Native Plant Consulting that does an online sale in St. Augustine. You can order online and then go pick them up. Um, <clears throat> the, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries or FAN lists native plant nurseries and you can contact them and see what plant, kind of plants they have. Um, there are some good native nurseries in Tallahassee and in the central part of the state around the Gainesville area. So if you're up for a road trip, those are good sources. We are trying to bring more natives in for our sale. Um, one of the reasons natives aren't offered in traditional nurseries is they really don't usually do well in pots. They look bad. They aren't in bloom when you know they the retailers want to sell them. Um, locally, Liberty Landscaping has tried in the past. So if you keep going to your nurseries and saying, I, I really want you to start um, stocking natives, they'll be more likely to do it. Or maybe they can do a special order for you because they do get plants from these same nurseries down in Central Florida that have natives, some of them. So you may be able to ask them to uh, get them for you. But mainly it's native plant sales, native plant association or society sales. Florabundance in Darien, Georgia. Okay, somebody says there's a native nursery in Darien called Florabundance. Uh, that's good to know because Darien's only a couple hours from here, so maybe hour and a half. So. Yeah, ha yeah, Hawthorne, Florida has Chiapini's nursery, which is definitely native. 
uh, Groveland, Florida, which is around the Howie in the Hills, Mount Dora area, has Green Isles Nursery. Um, I think there's one called Seminole Gardens that's not all native, but it had, had a lot of natives. So it's going to take a little bit of, of work to find these plants, but they're definitely worth it. And we are going to try to bring more in. We're going to start doing field trips and shopping for some of these plants. And that's where most of ours have come from. Uh, the Florida Wildflower Foundation has conferences most years and they sell wildflowers, but that's only once a year. I'm pulling on Taylor and moving the things around. You can order seeds from the um, Wildflower, Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, I don't plant too many things from seeds unless they plant themselves in my garden. But I, I've always thought, well, I should, I should do a seeded wildflower garden. And then the gentleman that wrote several of these wildflower books over here uh, kind of advised against it. He said, you may be successful, but you'd be more successful by buying a few plants and letting them receive themselves. So I thought, okay, I'm off the hook. I don't have to plant from yeah. seeds. <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm seeds are not my thing. But we do. I'll send it out there. We actually have a publication that's how to create wildflower yeah. meadows, copper sown And right now is the time to plant your wildflower garden, your wildflower meadow. Um, and I did. I did plant a wildflower meadow. I put cardboard down and mulch on top of it and killed the grass. And then I came in with, with plants and planted the wildflower meadow. And kind of like the dune sunflower, um, some of those plants decided they were gonna take over more of the space than I allotted them. So we're, it, it's getting constantly redesigned, but it's always in bloom. It's always full of pollinators, it's always full of rabbits, it's always full of birds. Um, the owls and the hawks like their dinner there too. I, find bird feathers. There's usually a pile of bird feathers near the, the wildflower garden, but uh, they've got to eat too. So, um, <clears throat> so these are the uh, references for the books that I have that are really good native plant sources for finding out about these books. And this Dr. Hegel, uh, he, he is the head of the University of South Florida Native Plant Botanical Garden. And he's grown these in his home and done little sales out of his home forever. So he's he's very knowledgeable about what actually grows. Because, um, you know, the research is great. This plant should do well here, but oftentimes as gardeners, you know that it doesn't always do that. And this is a benefit of this little publication is that it's also written by gardeners and they have little notes in there. This worked and this didn't. and you shouldn't do this and this would be better. So, um, you know, it's the more you research and the more you learn from, from reliable sources, the better, uh, the more successful you're gonna be. <clears throat> okay, so you're welcome to look through these books and I do have um, the seeds that I mentioned that you're welcome to take some home. There's baggies over there and I'm gonna, in this so that I can walk around and you guys don't don't miss me too much online. But if you have any questions, feel free to, to send them to uh, Taylor at this from at these numbers or emails. And thank you for attending. Okay, I have a question. I have bee that I I could conceive mm -hmm. because I should go through so I was in Texas and they promised me this stuff was, you know, so they had southeastern stuff. All I have is blue bob and some types of blue, some types of blue. Now it looks like part of it's all bright red. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not our native floor. Okay. And uh, I thank you for mentioning that, okay. Okay. because I wanted to say if you can source it locally, I try, but... uh, yeah, then and, and that's sometimes you have to do what, what you have to do. But if you source it locally, because uh, most a lot of these plants grow everywhere or you know most of the US, but if you get a plant from Kansas or Connecticut or Oregon, it's not gonna really like the plant. Yeah. Well they have different packs. I mean, this is a huge wildflower place in the 
no country is checking because it's just funny. I'm like, just feel full of wildflowers. I don't know, just eat the um, stuff. You cut it back, or I just cut it back and get rid of it. Or I'd like to have some native food, but I don't really know where to get it. Well, I could share some with you. <laughs> I don't have any for the plant sale, but if you want to um, send an email to Taylor and say you'd like to get some, maybe in the next yeah, world. Like, um, but it grew really easy to see. Mm -hmm. I can not believe it. Showing y'all some books. Yeah. But I mean, I put it in the third row in the little pocket. It's really not a fiber. I don't even have to do anything with it. Yeah, I um, these are all I some fun books. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's all I need. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know that if you if it's growing and doing well, I don't know that one can do it. Well, I don't know what it's doing. It's spreading all over. It's taking over. Things. Well, then you might want to do it. And I didn't know about cooking it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay, because but it's there is a lot of your flowers. It's so pretty. But some of it's turned red. Yeah, you know, all the, I, I came back, I was on a bus. I came back and there was a giant part of it and it's bright red, like a, like a, a poinsettia. And it's not a different oh. plant? No, it's not a different plant. Can you see? Because it is a native stone. Native Menarda, native Georgia. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's really red. Right. Oh, but, uh, oh, I don't know. This, this is, uh, I don't know, I can't look see. You know, the key was seed, but it's like, you know, this many seeds of zillion, you know, oh, tiny little thing. Yeah. I think yeah. I could just throw it out, but they said it. They had separate sections. Mm -hmm. for the country, and they gave me a book. I was going to bring it. I forgot. Plant the wildflower guys in the fall, like you're saying. And it's everything, but I don't know. Well, it, it, it's probably not. Mm -hmm. uh, Oh, yes, they are at the end of it. I like the first one. If y'all still have any I questions, feel free. I'll be here. I can help answer some of those questions. But I do want to thank you all for joining us today. And um, this program has been completely recorded, so you'll be able to get a digital copy of it on our YouTube channel. And I'll send you a link also to our, about our upcoming plant sale. It's on Friday. Cast check only. Um, and it's at our minor road office. Our new minor road office that we're not in yet, but we'll be in there eventually. Um, that address is at 85831, 85831 Minor Road. So if you're familiar with where Minor Road is in Yulee, it's essentially caddy corner from the, the Ace Hardware store that's right on Minor. Yeah, I will be sending you a copy of the, uh, the PowerPoint. So you get a copy of the PowerPoint and some of the digital references that we have. And I'll also send you a link to uh, the di this publication, the digital copy of it from um, the Florida Wildflower Association. So I wanna thank you all for joining us um, and feel free to shoot me an email or give us a phone call if you have any questions. And um, I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you for joining us. Oh, I gotta stop share. I didn't realize I'm still sharing something. There we go. This is easier. You're just looking at my wallpaper on my computer. <laughs> I closed the PowerPoint, but y'all are still looking at that screen. <laughs>